So in the next 30 minutes, I will provide you with an update of imaging of ovarian cancer. We are all now quite well aware that ovarian cancer is just an umbrella term for different cancer entities. But uh, the vast majority of these will be epithelial ovarian cancers. It's uh, the seventh most common cancer in females and among the most deadliest uh, cancers in females. One of the reasons is that um, many of these are diagno not diagnosed because, uh, because of their silent clinical course. And uh, three quarters of the tumors are usually diagnosed at a stage where there is already metastatic disease throughout the abdomen and pelvis. We are aware that approximately 15% of the ovarian cancers are uh, hereditary in nature and best uh, assessed is the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. Here, women with BRCA mutation uh, changes uh, have uh, a different risk to develop ovarian cancer. It's high with the BRCA1 mutation carrier, but what is typical for both of these is that these women uh, will develop cancer approximately 10 years earlier than the root cancer patients, meaning in the 40s and 50s. And despite the aggressive histology, there are new targeted therapies available. Other uh, familial cancer types are Lynch syndrome and Poitigas and the Gorling syndrome. Um, Ovarian cancer is managed in a multidisciplinary team approach. And here, Imaging plays a critical role in all aspects of the patient's disease at the time of confirmation to assist in guiding a patient-tailored treatment planning to um, assess the treatment response and also to demonstrate uh, the tumor recurrence. Due to the uh, time restriction in this lecture, I will only uh, be able to uh, focus on imaging findings at the time of diagnosis. And I will do so by dividing this lecture into three parts. I will go into characterization of sonographically indeterminate masses, then um, make you familiar with some aspects of tumorogenesis and what's the correlation with the imaging fact find features, and then I will finish with the role of imaging in treatment stratification. But let us start with characterization of a sonographically indeterminate mass. And the question here is usually, is it indeed cancer? Is it benign? Or is it the metastasis or another pelvic malignancy? And this um, systematic review from Greek authors have has beautifully shown that uh, indeed pelvic MRI is the gold standard to assess sonographically indeterminate masses. Uh, its value is number one, that it's excellent to assess benign lesions, so unnecessary surgery may be excluded. And MRI is also excellent to depict ovarian cancer. So how should we approach? Um, Adnexal mass sonographically indeterminate adnexal masses with MRI. Actually, there are two approaches. One are the SOA recommendation, and the other is the ORADS MRI score. This ORADS MRI score is a more recent approach, uh, and it's in keeping with the trend in imaging to score uh, malignant lesions. But the approach is not that different because if you look at the authors, there are many authors uh, in both papers that does the same. So I want to show you how this is done in this patient who is uh, in the classical age of ovarian cancer. She has this large mass. This is cystic. It has a higher proteinaceous content than the than fluid. But what is seen that it's not only cystic, it's also solid, and these nodules are enhancing. 
So how would we approach this by the ESO guidelines? Here we would look at the dominant feature uh, and this is in this case cystic and solid. And then with the use of gadolinium with DCE and diffusion, we will further narrow the differential diagnosis. The approach in uh, ORATS is a little bit different. What we do here is we look at the uh, cyst contents and, and this is important if there is solid tissue present. And if the solid tissue is present, we then assess the contrast enhancement pattern. And thus, analyzing the contrast enhancement pattern, we can differentiate between lesions that are of low, those that are intermediate, and those that are of high risk. Uh, as this is quite complicated, it's advisable to uh, load down this uh, ORATS calculator, because then uh, it is just much easier to assess this uh, classification. You can also tra train how to learn this. So uh, let's come back to uh, our lady. Uh, we have a lesion that is cystic with higher watery contents, and there are indeed solid enhancing nodules. And here, uh, in ASO, we would say this is a borderline or an invasive cancer. Um, or rats, um, here the type of enhancement pattern in the time intensity curve will differentiate, is this a borderline, if it's a type two, or is it more likely um, a, fi a, a, a ORATS 5 score. So type 2 is could correlate with MR ORATS 4 or in, in the type 3 curve with ORATS 5. So uh, in, indeed, this was a serous borderline uh, tumor. Actually, this MR ORATS classification has been very recently validated and many papers have come out. And the conclusion of all these papers is that it provides an accurate classification of low and high risk coalitions. And thus it helps to preoperatively uh, counsel and planning the surgery. So let's now uh, move on. And uh, the uh, recent uh, decades have shown great uh, advances in the understanding of tumor biology and in, uh, in and particularly in the characterization of the molecular properties of tumors. And uh, we, it's now accepted there are two major types of ovarian cancer, the type 2, uh, that accounts for the vast majority of ovarian cancers. And also it's called ovarian cancer. The origin is not the ovary, but the origin are stick lesions in the fallopian tube. Typical for these tumors is the high grade serous cancer uh, in histology or other aggressive tumor types. In contrast, the type one cancers account for only 20% of the tumors. Uh, here, only the low grade serous cancer derives from the fallopian tube, whereas the other cancers are originate either from cellular elements of the ovaries or, and that's important, from endometriosis. Differentiation of these two tumor types is important because these uh, present quite different clinical cancer uh, types. The type 2 are aggressive tumor types that are characterized by rapid growth, and rapid means probably a growth of a couple of months. Uh, they are characterized by high genetic instabilities, and typically in histology, we have high-grade serous and other very aggressive tumors. In contrast to the rarer type 2, these present indolent tumors. Um, they tend to have a slow growth. Um, and uh, what is quite typical is that it seems that there is a stepwise uh, development from pre uh, benign precursors to borderline uh, tumors to cancer. And the classical histologies are low-grade zeros, mucinous, endometrioid, and clear cell. 
So uh, a slow growth is quite typical of this. And this is illustrated by this patient uh, who had a clearly benign cystic ovarian mass. And six years later, she developed with uh, metastasis uh, from ovarian cancer that is shown here on PET-CT. We can also show in imaging the spectrum of benign uh, to invasive lesions. And this is shown in these three ladies with mucinous cancers. This is assisted anoma. This is a borderline tumor and this is invasive cancer. It's not the size, uh, but what is typical is that in benign tumors, there are thin septation, but there are no solid elements. Whereas in borderline tumors, there are more septations. These are thicker and we do have small mural papillary projections, whereas in this case of invasive cancer, there are large nodal aspects, but there is also uh, signs of peritoneal carcinomatosis. And it's uh, the type of enhancement pattern of the solid elements in borderline tumors that is quite typical. And uh, typical for borderline tumors is this uh, type 2 curve enhancement. And Dr. Damasa Nagara has shown in her study that the specificity of this uh, is quite high to diagnose uh, borderline tumors. Um, this uh, again shows the ma five major histological types of ovarian cancer. It's the type two, the high grade zeros, and these are the type one, low grade endometrioid, clear cell and mucinous cancer types. So differentiation of these tumors is important in many aspects because these are really completely different. If you look, the frequency is different the most common tumor is high grade serous cancer, where it's the least common is mucinous. They differ in the precursor lesions, they differ in the prognosis, and most recently, many uh, molecular alteration have been uh, diagnosed, and this gives rise to future targeted therapies. And they also differ in the stage uh, at the diagnosis. And the most common, that's high-grade serous cancer, is classically diagnosed at an advanced stage, whereas the rarer types here are typically found at an early stage. Uh, of course, there is uh, some overlap in imaging, but what I will do now is go more into detail of the characteristics of these different tumor types. And I will start with high-grade serous ovarian cancer. This is uh, the most common tumor type. It's typically bilateral and it's classically cystic and solid or only solid. What is Classical for this tumor type is that at the time of diagnosis, there is already ascites, there is diffuse peritoneal spread, and there are large amounts of ascites. But um, what is also typical is that there is this infiltrative pattern of metastatic disease. And this is typical for the BRCA negative tumor types. Why? Because this paper has analyzed the association between the BRCA mutation status and the imaging patterns of spread. And what they found is that the BRCA positive high grade serous cancers have a different uh, way of implants. They have nodular implants that are more displacing and pushing, uh, whereas the high grade with that are BRCA negative tend to have infiltrative diffuse implants. And there is also a difference in the site uh, of the predominant metastasis because in the BRCA positive, the mesentery uh, is less commonly involved than in the BRCA negative high grade serous ovarian cancers. Recent advance, advances in molecular classification have further subdivided uh, high grade 
ovarian cancer into different global genomic cancer types. And this study uh, analyzed if there is an association between these global subtypes of um, high-grade ovarian cancer and imaging features and metastatic spread. And what they have found that this, this is the mesenchymal type, is the type of uh, high-grade uh, ovarian cancer that is associated with a very poor prognosis and has a typical, very diffuse, infiltrative tumor growth. And this is, of course, an area of research where radiomics and radiogenomics are assessed. But we have still have to wait for valid data. So far for the grade two, for the most common, the high-grade serous cancer, let us now go to the imaging features of the uh, rarer tumors, the type two cancers, and I will start with low-grade serous ovarian cancer. What's here typical is that these tend also to be bilateral. We may have a borderline tumor or so solid or cystic tumors uh, of the ovaries. This tends to uh, grow slowly and the pattern of spread may be diffuse, abdominal or nodular. And a feature that may hint that this is indeed low-grade serous ovarian cancer are calcifications. Calcifications of the tumor, but also calcification of the deposits as seen here. This is an uh, unusual case I want to share with you of a patient with very advanced serous low-grade cancer, but what was seen in this patient was extensive uh, calcifications of the ovarian masses of all these peritoneal implants and even these small um, nodes supraclavicularly on the left side had a tiny calcification and all of these le lesions were highly uh, avid on PET CT. What about endometrial ovarian cancer? This is associated with endometriosis and these tumors tend to be mixed solid and cystic. Sometimes uh, we may also find these tumor types uh, in uh, solid aspects arising in the endometriotic cysts. It tends to be diagnosed at an early stage, but what uh, may also hint that this is endometrial cancer is the concurrent endometrial cancer or hyperplasia. This is an example of a patient with a large uh, ovarian mass. It's cystic, it's solid, and there is also endometrial cancer. In this case, it was a synchronous uh, endometrial ovarian cancer and um, endometrial cancer. But it is uh, often challenging to decide if this could be metastasis from uh, endometrial cancer. Let's now go to the other type that is associated with um, endometriosis, and that is clear cell cancer. These uh, tumors tend to be cystic with uh, nodules that are protruding into the lumen, and these have a high risk of thromboembolism. Um, the feature that is usually uh, where we can usually make the diagnosis at imaging is mucinous ovarian cancer. Why? Because these tend to be unilateral and typically these are large multiseptic tumors with thick septations. They have this glass, this uh, multilocular pattern and this stained glass appearance and they tend to be very large. And in these tumor types, we often have borderline tumors and within these borderline tumors, areas of invasive cancers that are developing. This slide just shows that uh, in advanced stages, these different tumor uh, types also differ in their prognosis. So let us now finish with treatment stratification in ovarian cancer and uh, also uh, surgical staging and uh, upfront cytoreduction is the treatment of choice in ovarian cancer. Imaging plays a critical um, part in the treatment decision. It helps to guide surgery for mapping and distribution and load of disease. 
It helps to identify difficult to resect disease. We can offer image-guided biopsy, and we can also assist if there is a question uh, to, uh, of uh, fertility sparing. But of course, this is all based on a multidisciplinary uh, decision. Um, we all know that uh, prognosis of a patient with ovarian cancer is uh, less um, influenced by the tumor extent, but more with the tumor after resection. And the volume of the residual disease is inversely correlates with the prognosis. This means uh, only optimal cytoreduction uh, with uh, no residual disease will result in the best um, prognosis for the patient. So we with Imogen can assist the surgeon and uh, provide a rope roadmap for uh, assessing all the metastases. So what are typical implants? Uh, typical implants are implants in the upper abdomen with uh, implants at the diaphragm. Uh, quite often we see them at the posterior aspect of the diaphragm. These are implants, surface implants of the liver in contrast to invasive implants of the liver. We should also alert the surgeons to um, metastasis of the surface of the spleen or um, implants in the gastrosplenic ligament as seen here. If uh, there is a close relationship between the solid aspect of the pelvic tumor and the sigmoid colon, then this is usually a sign of invasion of the serosa. Of course, we have to alert the surgeons to the presence of enlarged lymph nodes or not enlarged, but present lymph nodes and other findings like this shrunken uh, kidney and of course, sign, other signs of peritoneal carcinomatosis. This is a lady um, presenting with bilateral cystic solid uh, malignant dexamesis, but the question is, is this already stage three with the presence of large ascites? And if we look closely, we see that there are, is some fine thickening of the uh, diaphragm here, and there is some reticular pattern. And in laparoscopy, there was diffuse uh, peritoneal spread uh, corresponding to stage 3b. So if there is large size of ascites in the upper abdominal this is uh, associated with stage three. But what about here, this pleural effusion? Here it's important to really have a cytological proof to call this stage four. Uh, and from imaging, we must find uh, nodular lesions to call this uh, stage four. Um, MRI is superior to directly visualize the peritoneal spread, and this is shown in this patient where two days separate CT was performed and then uh, MRI followed. And we see better the peritoneal implants along the liver, but critical findings like these invasive implants or the nodules in the hepatosplenic ligament are seen also in CT. Um, this slide shows the imaging findings as uh, characterized uh, difficult to resect by the ESUR, but be aware that the criteria might differ from center to center and it depends on the aggressiveness of the surgeons. In general, the pelvis is almost always resectable, but it's the bulky disease in the upper abdomen. It's the metastasis around uh, the liver. Uh, these are the lymph nodes above the renal hilum, and it's particularly the mesentery. This um, are two patients I want to share with you from our institution that uh, we are called non-optimally -re uh, resectable, and where uh, chemotherapy was uh, performed and uh, 
why was this deemed non-optimally resectable? Because in this case, there is extensive disease in the gastrosplenic ligament as well as in the omental bursa, and there were also questionable lymph nodes. Or in this patient, there are two bilateral uh, solid uh, taxal masses. There is a lot of peritoneal disease. And what we see is that there is a retractile pattern. Um, and this uh, was decided that uh, image-guided biopsy should be performed, which uh, proved uh, high-grade uh, epithelial ovarian cancer. She did undergo uh, chemotherapy, and we see that the tumor is almost gone. There are some residual um, findings seen as well as some irregularity of the ovaries, and she did undergo a secondary um, cytoreduction. Uh, mesenteric disease is an area where uh, we really have to be aware of the subtle findings because it's quite uh, rare to have solid aspects as here. Um, of, more often we have a tethering of the mesentery or something that is called misty mesentery. And these um, slides were given to me from Avis Seller uh, from Cambridge. But there are other findings, like this bouquet sign, where it, there is a lot of ascites and the mesentery in the bowel loop are squeezed and they are seen in the center, or the retractile pattern is seen here, uh, where the bowels show angulation and abnormal kinking. And if it is a matter to define uh, further treatment, we can offer MRI and particularly with the use of diffusion weighted imaging, we will be uh, better to directly visualize the metastatic disease of the mesentery. What about the lymph nodes? Um, we have one centimeter as a threshold, but it's not the case uh, at, in, of cardiophrenic lymph nodes. These are clearly enlarged, but here we should already call these lymph nodes pathologic when they have a size of five millimeter, but we can improve our specificity if we increase, uh, in, increase the size to seven millimeter. The prediction of resectability has been a matter of debate in the literature, and this is just a study done by two major American cancer centers, and what they found that there were three clinical and six radiological findings uh, to predict um, uh, non-optimal resectability, and again, it was lymph nodes uh, above the renal hilum, metastasis in the lesser sac, small bowel mesentery, root of the basin mesentery, um, and also lesions in the spleno, uh, splenic ligament. Um, the classical presentation is that a patient presents uh, with um, advanced metastatic disease and she's in postmenopausal age. But what about a woman who is young uh, and with an uh, early stage cancer? Is there an option for fertility sparing? Yes, there is. However, the inclusion criteria have to be strict. Uh, fertility sparing surgery is established for early stage borderline tumors. And it can also be used for a subset of early invasive ovarian cancers. But this must be not aggressive histologies, meaning the type 1 cancers, and uh, there should only be unilateral involvement of stage 1. This was a patient I want to share with you, quite young, 25 years. She has clearly a mucinous tumor. It uh, was a borderline tumor, but the, the uh, cranial aspect here, there there were area of restricted diffusion and in pathology uh, stage one invasive cancer was already found. Here it was decided to perform a fertility sparing surgery, uh, but she will need a follow up clinically and ultrasound uh, at, um, or every three months. And we are doing annual follow up and we are following her now for several years and there is no evidence of recurrence. So what about this tumor? This is 
we have small tumors, but this is uh, bilateral. It was high grade in um, histology, and this uh, histology uh, precludes uh, conservative uh, management. So, dear colleagues, I wanted to show you that uh, imaging really is critical for uh, treatment planning. However, uh, we have to properly communicate our findings and structured reporting really is a powerful tool uh, to provide the critical information. Uh, the ESUR have um, published this structured reporting. Uh, it's uh, a management-driven report and should include include all the critical information that are needed. This includes the primary tumor, local complications, um, and details of metastasis, both uh, of the peritoneal cavity, but also of lymph nodes. And uh, very recently, and it's still ahead of press, this paper was published that uh, shows that we should uh, can use a standardized terminology. And using this terminology uh, from this lexicon will further improve the communication between uh, us and our uh, clinicians. And I really strongly recommend that uh, we use this uh, common language in the future. And with this, I would like to close my lecture and uh, send my best wishes from Salzburg uh, here. It's expected that tomorrow we will have a lot of snow and probably uh, this will look like this image I show you. So thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Foster, for an excellent talk. And the image of Salzburg is very pretty with the snow. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Please. Hello, uh, Dr. Forstner. Thank you for the excellent talk. Um, as far as I'm aware, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, the ORADS uh, classification system have, uh, has uh, some uh, prerequisites uh, uh, concerning the imaging protocol. And that is uh, T2 high resolution uh, sequences with small uh, field of view and uh, small slice thickness, but mainly perfusion imaging after uh, IV uh, contrast. And um, although we try to incorpor incorporate this uh, classification reporting system in our daily routine, although the majority of uh, the gynecologists are not fully familiar with this uh, uh, system yet, um, the question is, should we report according to ORADS, even uh, if uh, we have cases which are not performed with the optimal imaging protocol, and mainly if we have a delayed enhancement, uh, including the pelvis, and not uh, a dynamic perfusion, so that we cannot extract um, an enhancement curve. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think in the future, this ORAD classification will be a means of communication because if you think of pirates in the breast, pirates and all these, so it's just a tendency in medicine. Uh, it's true that um, um, ORADS needs a standardized protocol. Um, and if you look more in detail, uh, we need a dynamic contrast enhancement pattern. So what should not, we cannot um, really diagnose with ORADS if we have just uh, contrast enhancement in a delayed series. But if we have a, an arterial and a venous phase, then we can also use um, or rats, and you do not uh, have to have really this uh, time intensity curve. What you can do, and this is also seen, you can compare uh, visually with the enhancement uh, of the myometrium. If it's clearly um, higher, then it's five. It's, if it's uh, very delayed, then it would be um, three, and it's in between, it's four. 
Any other questions? I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Forson that lately, uh, together with my colleague, Dr. Bugiotti, we've had some cases of uh, invasive ovarian cancer, and uh, the type of curve was type 2 and not type 3. Do you have any comments on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is uh, also this is commonly seen because if you have a type 2 curve, then it's the pyrodes 4. And the really value of this classification is to separate between 1 to 3 and 4 and 5. And it's true. We also see a lot of invasive cancers that have this type 2 curve. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. And thank you again for the excellent talk.